Anchor standards addressed in this podcast include interpret words and phrases as they are used in a text, including determining technical, connotative, and figurative meanings, and analyze how specific word choices shape meaning or tone. You'll use many of Glencoe's literature reading skills and strategies throughout your years at Pine City High School. Students and staff have created a number of PCHS Dragon Reading podcasts to help you with your reading and understanding of content. Authors often use description to indicate the tone in an article or story. A description is a detailed explanation of a person, place, thing, or event. Good descriptive writing brings experiences and events to life. It helps readers see, hear, smell, taste, and feel the story's details. Descriptions help you gain a clearer picture of events in the story and may indirectly illustrate themes. In the story The All-American Slurp, the author uses description to help the reader understand the unfamiliar customs of two families who come together to share a meal. The narrator is embarrassed when her Chinese family displays their unfamiliarity with American customs. She is embarrassed when her family slurps their soup in a restaurant. Then came our dinner at the Lakeview restaurant. The Lakeview was an expensive restaurant, one of those places where a headwaiter dressed in tails conducted you to your seat, and the only light came from candles and flaming desserts. In one corner of the room, a lady harpist played tinkling melodies. Father wanted to celebrate because he had just been promoted. He worked for an electronics company, and after his English started improving, his superiors decided to appoint him to a position more suited to his training. The promotion not only brought a higher salary, but was also a tremendous boost to his pride. Up to then, we had eaten only in Chinese restaurants. Although my brother and I were becoming fond of hamburgers, my parents didn't care much for Western food, other than chow mein. But this was a special occasion and father asked his co-workers to recommend a really elegant restaurant. So there we were at the Lakeview, stumbling after the headwaiter in the murky dining room. At our table we were handed our menus, and they were so big that to read mine I almost had to stand up again. But why bother? It was mostly in French anyway. Father, being an engineer, was always systematic. He took out a pocket French dictionary. They told me that most of the items would be in French, so I came prepared. He even had a pocket flashlight the size of a marking pen. While Mother held the flashlight over the menu, he looked up the items that were in French. Passé en cru, he muttered. Let's see, passé is paste, cru is crust. Hmm, a paste in crust. The waiter stood looking patient. I squirmed and died at least fifty times. At long last, Father gave up. Why don't we just order four complete dinners at random, he suggested. Isn't that risky? asked Mother. The French eat some rather peculiar things, I've heard. A Chinese man can eat anything a Frenchman can eat, Father declared. The soup arrived in a plate. How do you get soup up from a plate? I glanced at the other diners, but the ones at the nearby tables were not on their soup course, while the more distant ones were invisible in the darkness. Fortunately, my parents had studied books on Western etiquette before they came to America. Tilt your plate, whispered my mother. It's easier to spoon the soup up that way. She was right. Tilting the plate did the trick. But the etiquette book didn't say anything about what you did after the soup reached your lips. As any respectable Chinese knows, the correct way to eat your soup is to slurp. This helps to cool the liquid and prevent you from burning your lips. It also shows your appreciation. We showed our appreciation. Went my father. Went my mother. Went my brother, who was the hungriest. The lady harpist stopped playing to take a rest. And in the silence, our family's consumption of soup suddenly seemed unnaturally loud. You know how it sounds on a rocky beach when the tide goes out and the water drains out from all those little pools? They go, That was the Lin family, eating soup.
The author of this story helps the reader form an image of the setting, as well as revealing what the narrator is feeling. Remember the anchor standard involves shaping meaning or tone through vocabulary. Do you believe that the author had this in mind while writing this portion of the story? The reading strategies used in this lesson include clarifying by looking at difficult sections of text in order to clear up what is confusing. This may be done by using a strategy like click and clunk. After reading a paragraph, you need to ask if that paragraph clicked or clunked. If it clicked, then it made sense and you can continue reading. If the paragraph clunked, then you must ask what you can do to make sense of the reading. Often it is necessary to define a vocabulary word. Sometimes you might choose to discuss the paragraph or section with a reading partner, or you can decide to reread the paragraph or section again. Often, one of these options will do the trick in helping you understand what the paragraph is about. We are learning how an author may use words or phrases in a text to help us shape the meaning or tone of an article. In the Glencoe text, a myth titled Arachne by Olivia E. Coolidge gives us an example of how words are used to shape meaning. Remember that a myth is a traditional story that deals with gods and goddesses, heroes, and supernatural forces. A myth might explain a belief, a custom, or a force of nature. Myths are important because they tell readers about the beliefs and values of a group of people. Reading myths can help you understand different aspects of the world and of human nature. Arachne was a maiden who became famous throughout Greece, though she was neither well-born nor beautiful and came from no great city. She lived in an obscure little village, and her father was a humble dyer of wool. In this he was very skillful, producing many varied shades, while above all he was famous for the clear, bright scarlet which is made from shellfish, and which was the most glorious of all the colors used in ancient Greece. Even more skillful than her father was Arachne. It was her task to spin the fleecy wool into a fine, soft thread and to weave it into cloth on the high standing loom within the cottage. Arachne was small and pale from much working. Her eyes were light and her hair was a dusty brown, yet she was quick and graceful, and her fingers roughened as they were went so fast that it was hard to follow their flickering movements. So soft and even was her thread, so fine her cloth, so gorgeous her embroidery, that soon her products were known all over Greece. No one had ever seen the like of them before. At last Arachne's fame became so great that people used to come from far and wide to watch her working. Even the graceful nymphs would steal in from stream or forest and peep shyly through the dark doorway, watching in wonder the white arms of Arachne as she stood at the loom and threw the shuttle from hand to hand between the hanging threads, or drew out the long wool, fine as a hair, from the distaff as she sat spinning. Surely Athene herself must have taught her, people would murmur to one another. Who else could know the secret of such marvelous skill? Arachne was used to being wondered at, and she was immensely proud of the skill that had brought so many to look on her. Praise was all she lived for, and it displeased her greatly that people should think anyone, even a goddess, could teach her anything. Therefore, when she heard them murmur, she would stop her work and turn round indignantly to say, with my own ten fingers I gained this skill, and by hard practice from early morning till night. I never had time to stand looking as you people do while another maiden worked, nor if I had, would I give Athene credit because the girl was more skillful than I. As for Athene's weaving, how could there be finer cloth or more beautiful embroidery than mine? If Athene herself were to come down and compete with me, she could do no better than I. One day when Arachne turned round with such words, an old woman answered her, a grey old woman, bent and very poor, who stood leaning on a staff and peering at Arachne amid the crowd of onlookers. Reckless girl, she said, how dare you claim to be equal to the immortal gods themselves? I am an old woman and have seen much. Take my advice and ask pardon of Athene for your words. Rest content with your fame of being the best spinner and weaver that mortal eyes have ever beheld. Stupid old woman, said Arachne indignantly, 
Who gave you a right to speak in this way to me? It is easy to see that you were never good for anything in your day, or you would not come here in poverty and rags to gaze at my skill. If Athene resents my words, let her answer them herself. I have challenged her to a contest, but she, of course, will not come. It is easy for the gods to avoid matching their skill with that of men. As you read this myth, you can feel the tone of the story take shape. The two characters are in competition with one another, and as the story progresses you might predict that they will have to come up with a way to resolve the conflict. What do you feel as a reader after listening to and reading the last statement? How would you describe the tone of this myth? I have challenged her to a contest, but she, of course, will not come. It is easy for the gods to avoid matching their skill with that of men. I want to remind you again that the anchor standard that this podcast addresses is interpret words and phrases as they are used in a text including determining technical, connotative, and figurative meanings, and analyze how specific word choices shape meaning or tone. Plays are another example of authors using words and phrases to shape meaning or tone. In a play, the author uses dialogue to tell the story. Dialogue is conversation between characters in a literary work. A play relies on dialogue to tell a story. Damon and Pythias was written as a radio play. Its dialogue reveals information about the characters and advances the plot. Stage directions, the words in brackets and italics, may describe the setting or tell the actors how to move, look, or say their lines. While you read and listen to the play, think about what you learn about each character through the dialogue. More than 2,000 years ago, the Roman writer Cicero wrote down an ancient Greek story about two friends, Damon and Pythias. The story is set in the 4th century BC in Syracuse, a city on the island of Sicily. Syracuse was a powerful city in the ancient world and was ruled by a tyrant king, Dionysus the Elder. There are many versions of the story of Damon and Pythias. This version was written as a radio play. Diction is an author's use of words. Skilled writers carefully choose their words to get across a particular meaning or feeling. It is important to analyze diction because it helps you understand how certain words contribute to the tone or message of a story. When you analyze diction, pay attention to the literal meaning or definition of a word. Connotation is the implied meaning of a word. It may trigger an emotional response in you that may be positive or negative. Particular words add to your understanding of the play. The king of that country was a cruel tyrant. He made cruel laws, and he showed no mercy toward anyone who broke his laws. An example of diction here indicates that the king is tough, inflexible, merciless, and cruel. Listen as I read the words spoke by the character Damon in this play. As I read, try to determine what Damon's style of speaking tells you about him. Oh, Pythias, how terrible to find you here. I wish I could do something to save you. What is it? I will do anything to help you. I'll take care of them, Pythias, as if they were my own mother and sister. I'll go to the king and beg him to give you your freedom for a few days. He'll give your word to return at the end of that time. Everyone in Sicily knows you for a man who has never broken his word. I'll tell him that I shall take your place in the prison cell. I'll tell him that if you do not return by the appointed day, he may kill me in your place. Do you get the feeling that Damon is humble and not ashamed to plead for his friend's cause? The anchor standard that was addressed in this podcast included interpret words and phrases as they were used in a text, including determining technical, connotative, and figurative meanings, and analyze how specific word choices shape meaning or tone. Hopefully you now have a deeper understanding of the skill 
and can use the skill when you are reading articles for classes you are taking or in reading that you are doing for enjoyment.